I am pleased to introduce Martha Minow, who will respond on behalf of the honorary degree recipients. <laughs> Chair Chesler, all the trustees, Madam President, faculty, administrators, staff, parents, siblings, friends and partners, And graduates of the class of 2024! I congratulate you all, including my fellow distinguished honorands, and I give thanks to that I, too, am violent. During my first week of college, my dorm neighbor hung a poster with Henry David Thoreau's statement, if a man does not keep pace, with his companions. Perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. And I looked at it and I thought, that's right. But then on the other wall, the other roommate posted a poster that said, no man is an island. And I thought, that's right, too. Both good insights, but at odds with one another. Celebrate distinctive individualism or recognize that all humans are joined together. Today, some people say, work against injustice as Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa once explained, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Don't demonize your adversaries. United States Congressman Steve Scalise, with whom I disagree on more policies than I can count, nonetheless powerfully made the point. When everybody goes in their separate corners, it's just easy to demonize the other side. Instead of saying, OK, how can we come together and figure out how to get done what's important? Work against injustice. Don't demonize your adversaries. Can both views be right? For me, F. Scott Fitzgerald's observation helps. He said, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in mind 
at the same time and still be able to function. Also, the touchstone for me comes from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King had organized a peaceful civil rights protest against racial injustice after being told that his group would never be granted a permit without notice or participation with King, the city officials got a court order banning the march. Dr. King and seven other ministers were arrested. They were placed in jail. And then eight white Christian clergymen who opposed the civil rights protest issued a call for patience. Dr. King wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail. While locked up in the era of lynching in Birmingham, Alabama, and he wrote, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. This statement endures because it makes palpable how justice is and must be about recognizing that all of us are interconnected. Despite patterns of social division and separation, inequality enchains people in hierarchies not of their making, entrenching advantage and disadvantage. Dr. King praised the nonviolent demonstrators for their sublime courage, their willingness to suffer, and their amazing discipline in the midst of great provocation. One day, he said, the South will recognize its real heroes. And so it seemed. But in the past few years, in the United States, 44 states are debating laws restricting instruction in schools or by employers about race or civil rights history. The laws have been adopted in 18 states, and they ban instruction that may make some people feel that they bear personal responsibility for historic wrongdoing because of their race, gender, or national origin. Court challenges are underway to protect freedom of speech and information, but struggles against inequality and injustice risk erasure. Today, here are people graduating from 116 countries and independent provinces. You all know that this struggle about history and what to remember exists across the world. 
in the United States in 2024, the belief that we are divided is one of the few things that Americans currently have in common. Half of Americans say they report a country composed primarily of people rooted in Western Europe, and the other half disagree. Tensions in many countries reveal divisions, distrust, and unscrupulous leaders and social media algorithms amplify outrage. We draw distinctions. Apparently, it's deeply ingrained in being human. Did you know that the world is divided between two groups? Those who think there are two groups and those who do not? Seriously, the definition of us and them reflects arguments and fears, not immutable realities. Ideas about race, gender, religion, these ideas about disability, ethnicity, reflect fears, not reality. But beliefs resist facts. People categorize others as less so that they can feel like more. So with the inevitable disagreements, is civility, respect possible? Can those who disagree listen? It's very hard to listen when our identities are implicated, then it all seems to be about survival. We put up barriers when we feel threatened. It is difficult, if not impossible, to see anything we share, much less to accord the kind of respect that makes the world safer for everyone. But sometimes, even those who disagree, we can persuade one another. David Singleton, who directed the Ohio Justice and Policy Center, told me that when he moved to Ohio, he picked out his opponents. And to his surprise, they became his allies. Today's adversary can become an ally another day. And history shows that it is coalitions across many kinds of difference that have been at the center of successful movements for civil rights, labor rights, environmental protection, human rights. Prospects for that possibility dim when disagreement leads to banishment. And that's the problem with demonizing others. It strips away the humanity and threatens to unleash the darkest aspects of human nature. So said human rights activist Salil Shetty. Even when motivated by righteousness against injustice, demonizing others opens passions that can destroy and shame, spurring new rounds of violence. I know I have to work at it every day, and not just because I drive in Boston. My hope is that we can learn from patterns 
of division and polarization, anticipate backlash. Cultural creativity helps. I look at NYU professor Brian Stevenson and his Equal Justice Initiative team. They built the National Memorial for Peace and Justice Museum and Sculpture Park in Montgomery, Alabama, where people come from all over the world. How can we assemble durable activities to advance justice and strengthen fair and peaceful dealing despite ongoing disagreements? By durable, I don't mean unchanging, but addressing what is unfair while anticipating despair, conflict, and our human frailties. Okay, I have a confession. I'm a fan of Star Trek. I'm a Trekkie. The science fiction saga that grew from a small audience cult television show to a global media franchise. Trekkies, show yourselves. It tells of 23rd and 24th century space travels in allegories of contemporary dilemmas. In one episode, competing groups race across planets to find scattered pieces of a prized relic from a prior civilization. A team from different societies collaborates and finds the first piece, then the second, and finally a third. But suddenly, one member of the team puts the pieces together and turns on the others and announces that the pieces, once assembled, make a powerful weapon. Our hero, Captain Picard, who is conveniently also an archaeologist, orders his crew to drop their weapons and clear their minds of aggressive thoughts. He explains that he was able to read the symbols on the device and discern that it amplifies anger, but peace defeats its power. Tamping down even understandable fury is key to building enough peace to proceed with the work of building justice and better days. Now look, what I have said today may madden everyone here. And if so, that could be a way to come together. I'm still trying to talk myself down from the demonizing ledge where I landed when writing a brief recently. Perhaps we can all agree that the past is written, the future is left for us to write, one way or the other. Let's do it not by amplifying hate, but by remembering how we each are uniquely of value and we are each part of one another. Thank you and congratulations, class of 2024.